All right, what's up, everybody? So I hope if you've had a chance to read this section of the book, uh, you know that it is really long. It's a lot of material, like a lot. So, so much so that it's possible to cover all the main points in what I hope to be a 10 minute video. Uh, so just a couple of highlights, but here's the thing, you have freedom to just scrap whatever I say and uh, talk about the main points that stuck out to you. But um, since I'm the one in front of the camera, here are, here are the couple things that I really pulled out of this section. So number one, and I think one of the most important parts of the whole book is the, the end goal of discipleship is Jesus. It's connection with Jesus. Uh, you know, always remember the goal of discipleship itself is not some abstract concept. It's the person of Jesus. And that is incredibly important uh, to be with Jesus, to know Jesus, and to become like Jesus. It's relational. Uh, and this means that uh, to reflect his character in our daily lives is a crucial aspect uh, of, of discipleship. Um, it's, again, it's not an abstract thing. It's boots on the ground with real people in real situations. So I will continue to bring us back to one of the most uh, hinge point moments in all of Scripture, and that is the revelation of God to the nation of Israel in Exodus 34, 6, where God reveals his character to them because that's the character that we see Jesus reflecting in the New Testament. This is what the Exodus passage says. It says Yahweh, if you're not familiar with that name, that's God's personal name in the Old Testament just means I am. So uh, Yahweh, the Lord, the God of compassion and mercy, I'm slow to anger and filled with unfailing love and faithfulness. Again, this is the character we see lived out in the flesh in Jesus. So a, you know, kind of a Bible study encouragement, when you're reading through the Gospels, have this passage from Exodus in the back of your mind or in your pocket and just be thinking about it. You'll Look for the, the examples and the ways of the way Jesus is living out this character of God, because he is. That is the character of Jesus. Um, it's lived out. You know, not only that, this is the character that the Spirit is cultivating in us as we follow Jesus, as we know Jesus, as we come to love and be like Jesus. This is the character. Um, this is the character. I like to say that this character lived out with real people in real time. It looks like those C words, compassion, connection, consistency, and courage. So bottom line, uh, we've been created to be like Jesus, and the, really the focus of discipleship is being with Jesus. It's never just an abstract concept. Number two, uh, and something that Comer keeps bringing up in this book is that we're being, we're being formed or molded by something all the time. We're always being formed by something, and it's an important one. And another thing he just keeps bringing up within that is being formed by Jesus doesn't just happen. It takes intentionality. And uh, he, he brings to the forefront something that we need to see this discipleship as practice uh, and training, not just trying harder, which uh, Think is also very important. You know, for the time we have, as we think about being formed or molded, um, two of the primary ways uh, to practice this are solitude and community. Uh, and in, Com in Comer's book, these are on repeat, and for good reason. That solitude and community. Uh, however, since this video is coming out after Chris's sermon on solitude, let's focus on the practice of solitude. Uh, I assume it was a good sermon. Um, Cody, let's go ahead and say, was it a, out of one out of 10, what was it? I never want to give a full 10. I'll give it a, like seven and a half. So good job, Chris. You got a seven and a half pre-rating pre from Cody. So, um, but along with uh, the sermon series, you've, we've had these, these brochures. And so I'm including this in your discussion sheet with the QR code. Uh, so it's got practical aspects of how to practice uh, solitude. So I want to highlight that. Uh, but in this guide and in the book, uh, it, the, the definition of solitude is the practice of intentionally spending time alone with God, free from distractions. Again, the practice of intentionally spending time alone with God, free from distractions. Now, 
the obvious problem that comes up here is, drum roll, free from distractions because I don't know about you, that feels almost impossible. Free from distractions. So um, one of the quotes I wanna bring up on page 53, Comer states the problem in a humorous and vivid way that I, I wanna call to our attention. It's page 53 and this, the quote's gonna be on the screen. Some days my mind is sharp and alert. My heart is burning for God and I feel God's nearness. Other days, more often than not, my mind is like a banana tree filled with monkeys, as Henry Nowen once said. It's all over the place. My heart is troubled and afraid, and I struggle to pay attention. A banana tree filled with monkeys. What? A, talking about a vivid, amazing image of the distracted minds that we have in this modern world when we're trying to spend time alone, not only with God, with anybody. Um, and this is where my mind went when I read this. So there's a city in Thailand called Lop Buri. I think I'm saying that right. Um, it's literally overrun with monkeys. There are monkeys everywhere. You can actually, you can Google it. If you Google Thailand monkey city, there'll be articles and videos uh, all over the place about this. In fact, recent, like even recently, the city's trying to figure out what to do with this monkey infestation. Uh, I saw this firsthand in almost 20 years ago in 2005 when I visited Thailand with my mom, my brother, and my sister. Uh, when I say they're everywhere, they are everywhere. Okay, climbing on things, stealing things. Um, you can't have, like if you're walking down the street with ice cream, somebody's, some monkey's gonna sweep down and take your ice cream. It, it, it's nuts. It's not like rodents that scatter, they jump on people. One jumped on my mom and it took my brother just knocking the thing off uh, before we tried to get out of there. Um, I wish I had it on video, but this is before the iPhone, so it's just a mere memory. But bottom line, it was absolute chaos. So yeah, the chaos of monkeys in a banana tree is a perfect metaphor for our brains when we try to connect with Jesus. I don't know if you feel like that, I do. But here's the deal. Comer is quoting Henry Nowen. Uh, it's from an article from actually 1995 in Christian Today Leadership Journal. Uh, and I wanna read an excerpt from it. Now it's long, but it's rich. It'll be on your screen. Uh, and in, in your group uh, discussion sheet, there's a QR code to the full article um, if you're interested. And I, I encourage you to read this. It. It's really rich. Here's the quote, again, it's long, but it's rich. Oh, if we could just sit for one out, half hour a day doing nothing except taking a simple word from the gospel and putting it in front of us. And let that truth descend from our mind into our heart. Gradually those words are written on the walls of our inner holy place. That becomes the space in which we can receive our colleagues and our work, our family and our friends and the people whom we will meet during the day. The trouble is, as soon as you sit and become quiet, you think, oh, I forgot this. I should call my friend. Later on, I'm going to see him. Your inner life is like a banana tree filled with monkeys jumping up and down. It's not easy to sit and trust that in solitude, God will speak to you, not as a magical voice, but he, that he will let you know something gradually over the years. And in that word from God, you will find the inner, peace, inner place from which to live your life. Solitude is where spiritual formation begins. That's where Jesus listened to God. That's where we listen to God. Sometimes I think of life as a big wagon wheel with many spokes. In the middle is a hub, it's the hub. Often in life, it looks like we're running around the rim trying to reach everybody. But God says, start in the hub, live in the hub. Then you will be connected with all the spokes and you won't have to run so fast. You know, if you note the uh, wheel and hub illustration that we used last month, um, in case you're wondering, I didn't make that up. Uh, but I want to encourage, encourage you to continue to, to meditate and you know, think about that illustration asking God to reveal to you the areas of your life that are forming you 
more than Jesus. When closing, you know, Nowen also said, and Comer highlights this, he likes Nowen, um, without solitude, it is virtually impossible to live a spiritual life. Now, you may or may not agree with that, but the spiritual practice of solitude is something that you must try to incorporate and wrestle with for your own spiritual formation into the image of Jesus. You know, in the, in the solitude brochure, you'll find simple practical suggestions for a time of solitude that I want to really encourage you to, to dive into. You know, this is not this woo-woo non-Christian spiritual practice. This is what Jesus himself routinely did throughout the gospels. And the invitation is there for us too. It's focusing on who God is and who we are because of who God is. And this brings us to a final crucial point. In solitude, how we think about God is, the most, is one of the most important things about us. In fact, Comer quotes A.W. Tozer as well, and we've used this quote before. Uh, Tozer says this, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. Comer again, and this quote's on the screen. Because we become like our mental picture of God, for this reason, spiritual formation in the way of Jesus begins with the healing of our false images of God. If a person's vision of God is distorted, if they view him as harsh, demeaning, chronically angry or liberal, laissez-faire, or simply there to champion their sexual pleasure, the more religious they become, the worse they become, because we become like who we believe God is. Again, because we become like who we believe God is. So as we close this video out, when you practice in solitude, the question is, who do you picture what is your mental image of God when you think of God? You know, the more you're around me, you'll realize that the prodigal son parable is a very formative story for me. It's a very formative story for a lot of Christians. And there's a reason for that. Because in it, Jesus gives a very vivid picture of God that is very tangible and we can grasp. A loving parent who embraces his lost child. That's something that a lot of people have experienced. It's something a lot of people, even if they haven't experienced, they've longed for. But in that parable, the picture of God is he doesn't greet his son with folded arms or illicit demands or with retribution, but with compassion and connection, inviting both of the sons actually to the banquet, to the party. I invite you to think about that parable when you practice the habit of solitude, when you struggle and try to incorporate this habit of solitude. This is the picture of God we must bring to the forefront of our minds because I think it's true that we become like who we believe God is. That's actually the point of the parable, to give us a picture of the one whom we're called to become like, and that's Christ Jesus. So again, this was um, uh, this a little bit long video, so this is a very long reading but thank you for sticking with it. There was so much good stuff in here. You know, we were forced to kind of pick out just a couple of highlights. And again, I would invite you as you're processing with your group, you can scrap the questions and kind of highlight, bring up the highlights uh, you wanted, or you can follow along with the discussion guide that's, that's given to you. The main thing is encourage one another along as you intentionally seek Jesus together. Thank you.